When Barbados recorded its first case of COVID-19 in March 2020, many new restrictions would need to be implemented to prevent its spread. What wasn't known was how prolonged and devastating the resulting effects would be on businesses of all sizes. For small and medium-sized enterprises, it has had debilitating repercussions. But on this one-on-one, -on -one, we take a look at what government is doing and plans to do to help entrepreneurs get back on their feet. Good evening. I am Lisa Lord. Our special guest is the Minister of Energy, Small Business and Entrepreneurship, the Honorable Kerry Simmons. Minister, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lisa. Now, you do have a major portfolio, but for the purposes of this interview, we will focus on small business and entrepreneurship. Okay. It's been a full 12 months of COVID, point blank. How have micro and small businesses been doing? We know it's been tough. Yes, yeah, it's been very tough. And I, <clears throat> I think micro and small businesses have taken a hit. There's no question about that. And the challenge really for us now is above, uh, above and beyond everything else, uh, relief and survival. And uh, then at, as we come out of that survival stage, we now have to put a number of serious policy initiatives in place um, to ensure the growth of the sector. Um, but the key thing right now is the survival aspect of it. During the past year, you would have had two lockdown periods. Mm -hmm. Speaking of relief, government would have intervened and provided some level of assistance to those small businesses. Have all the funds been disbursed? Well, here's the thing. There, there, are, there are still funds being disbursed as we speak. We have gotten the entire vote from Parliament um, on the eve of the estimates, and the estimates would have con concluded week before last, mm -hmm. we would have gone back to Parliament for another $6.5 million, which was calculated in order to carry us through all of the um, requirements as we understood it up to that time. I would have to say to you that the availability of the money is a little bit slower than I ideally would have liked. Um, we have been dispersing about $3.5 million of that 6.5 during the course of the last week. Um, so the disbursement process has started um, with regard to that second tranche, but obviously that still leaves me short of about $3 million, which we have to deal with as we go into the next coming weeks. This is a difficult question. We can't see into the future, mm -hmm. but many business people have already said they couldn't handle the second one. Can they possibly handle a third? You mean a shutdown? Yep. Yeah, and I think it is a very critical concern for the, the business sector. Um, uh, and that is one of the reasons why, quite frankly, the restrictions, um, the directives, which have brought restrictions to bear, the Prime Minister likes to say, periods of pause, mm -hmm. um, have been so, so sharp and so severe. Um, I tend to say that we would not have liked to have a lot of people out on the beaches enjoying themselves over the bank holiday. Um, I don't want to speak about the couple bank holidays which are to come because we haven't gotten there yet and we are managing to get the numbers under control. But the reality is that um, after what happened at Christmas and during that festive season, it is just simply too dangerous to take the risk of a repetition because the economy, I think, has been uh, estimated to lose over $3 million a week when we have that kind of $300 million a week when we have that, that type of difficulty. No, while some businesses have reopened, <coughs> others have not. Mm -hmm. Some business people have said, we cannot do this. Mm -hmm. The uncertainty is too much. Yeah. You take a walk through Bridgetown and other popular places and you see these, these stores are closed. How concerned are you as small business minister about that? I am. As it, is, it is a very concerning thing. And I think one of the challenges that we have to face is how do we, as I said, we are really in a survival mode. Um, so we are trying to get those businesses that can um, to a place where they can be comfortable and survive into the future. <coughs> Obviously, there are some businesses which have taken such a sharp hit that it is impossible to keep them above water. Under my um, ministry's jurisdiction is the Office of the Supervisor of Insolvency. And we are doing a lot of business advisory counseling. We are working with people on an everyday basis. And believe you me, Lisa, it is a very challenging thing because obviously the office was created but not necessarily staffed with an anticipation of this level of demand. Um, but when you have people who write in to you and say that they need an urgent meeting because 
they're on the verge of suicide. We have had to deal with one or two of those types of situations. You know, you have to prioritize those people. And wherever it is possible, you have to walk them through all of the menu of options. And again, part of the challenge that we have is that a lot of people are running a business, but don't fully understand the whole range of options that may or may not be available to them if they want to um, get out of this type of situation. <coughs> so what the, the Office of the um, Supervisor of Insolvency has to do is to work with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis in order to try to guide them or navigate them through the, 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 um, the challenges that are confronting them at the moment. Um, you, you asked me about the wider Bridgetown. I take the point. I, I would have to say there are a number of people who have taken a deliberate decision to move away from the bricks and mortar mm -hmm. type of um, business. They're saying, look, given where we are right now, it's not making financial sense for me to pay rent. I would prefer to do this in a different way. So they reassess their entire business model. And part of what they're then doing, say for example, is that they may say they're going online. So you may have a clothing store, which was renting space. Now they say, look, I can't do this, but what I will do is to, I will use Facebook and other online platforms. I will continue to be in business, but it saves me that overhead, which otherwise I would have to commit to because I'm not using the same amount of electricity. I'm not using, I'm not paying rent, whatever else. Um, it obviously has an impact in two ways because the people who are doing the renting are obviously in business too. Mm -hmm. And so when I lose a tenant, I am, I am losing business and there's a challenge from that end. Um, <clears throat> equally with regard to the employment side of it, uh, what then we encourage people to do is to say, well, listen, instead of just going online, if it is possible, save a job, look at the issue of deliveries. Let us also look at the value chain so that it may be possible for you to join with a couple of others uh, who are doing a similar thing. And your, your issue then is that you have a couple of people to work with for delivery purposes, for sourcing of your materials, whatever else. Um, if it, step by step along the way, there are a number of companies who assist in the output of any one company or in any one business. And where we're, wherever it is possible, we're trying to bring those people together in a chain so as to assess, assess what strengths exist, what weaknesses they are, and how they can pull their, their efforts together in order to keep each other um, alive. You mentioned both survival and options. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the greatest challenges for many small businesses over the years has been access to capital. Mm -hmm. We know going to the bank is not an option for many of them. However, under your ministry, you have both fund access and mm -hmm. you have the Barbados Trust Fund Limited. Let's mm -hmm. look at the latter first. Mm -hmm. How has the fund been performing over the last two years? It's been for performing surprisingly well. Um, and I, I say surprisingly because of the fact that one would have anticipated that during this um, period of difficulty, which was obviously not anticipated when the trust fund was created, that you would have a lot of people who would just simply say, well, I got easy money and I am bothering about the repay. repay. Not true. <clears throat> Quite the opposite, in fact. There are a lot of people, and as recently as yesterday, I had this discussion with the chairman and, and, and general manager, um, they were telling me about a number of cases that they're dealing with where the issue really is how best can we repay and it is a similar thing to what I discussed earlier with regard to the office of insolvency people want to be able to pay back the government they want to be able to pay their way and pay their loan um, their biggest challenge is I see in front of me X amount of dollars as being the obligation I have right now as I look at where I'm at today I'm not seeing how I'm going to meet that obligation on a week by week or month by month basis without going into more serious difficulty. So help me to help you. I, I want to be able to pay you. That's basically the message that we get when they come to us. And so um, we've done a number of things. Uh, last year, we looked at creating moratoria on the loans, on the um, repayments, mm -hmm. so that for three months, say, don't bother to pay back we understand the circumstances. For some people that was sufficient to get them going again, other people needed a longer period of time. That was then ex extended by another three months. So you say for six months, you don't have to, to worry about that, catch yourself and you come back again. Again, there are some people where that prescription works satisfactorily. There are others who have, as we just indicated, because we've gone back into another shutdown, 
uh, and there may be other variables that come to bear. Other people have different challenges. One size cap never fits all. Mm -hmm. And so therefore you have to try to see what other flexibilities you can build into it. One of the things that we have been looking at, quite frankly, is to waive interest. Mm -hmm. And so they repair the principal and let us just um, forget about the interest. Now, that is a matter which is before the board even as I speak because it is a, 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 a policy recommendation that we've talked through and now we just need to have final sign off on that. Um, the other thing that we're looking at, of course, is that above and beyond dealing with the interest, you deal with the tenor, the length of the loan. And if you can extend mm -hmm. that, it gives people a greater degree of flexibility, especially as you can then renegotiate rene the, the time over which you, you have to pay back. And that gives you a longer period of time, more financial um, wiggle room, so to speak, and that helps you um, considerably. So there is no one prescription. I tend to prefer to look at this as trying to make sure that we leave nobody out. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, the key thing to remember in this business is that no one size prescription is going to satisfy every business enterprise because some, quite frankly, have done better in COVID than they did out of COVID. Um, <clears throat> and there are others which obviously are suffering and struggling to stay, stay afloat. And where we have to, to do our, our interventions, we're then looking at them business by business and having the business officers work with these companies um, as, they, you know, as they, they go forward. So you don't have an issue with delinquency? No, not really. I would have to say to you that the, when it began, I know what the public concern mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. uh, oh gosh, you're asking people to take an interest-free loan, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a collateral-free loan, and they may not pay back and so on. And I think that the percentages show that there, there has been a far better than anticipated performance. I wish I had the exact figures on the top of my mind, but you know, I shared them with the country during the by-election in October, and I believe from the Prime Minister back down was quite surprised at how well this has been going. And I think it's, it also tells another story. A lot of Barbadians want to be able to have the independence of being in business. A lot of them see this as, a, as a, an opportunity to do something for themselves and their family that otherwise they would not have had. So they take it seriously. That is not to say that you don't have one or two who have been delinquent, that is true. Um, but our delinquency um, levels and, and, and um, non-performing loans have not really been of a substantial degree of, of concern at all. I think what is also important in all of this is that we have learned a few valuable lessons ourselves. And let me say this to you. Um, I think that when the trust loans was created, one mistake we made was that we did not um, fully appreciate the importance of business um, advisory support. Now, I have said in the estimates, and I'll say here, business advisory support now strikes me as being critical to, on the way forward because right now we are lending people money mm -hmm. and we do say as part of the loan arrangement that we want you now to benefit from a little bit of education and in order to help you manage this business so that you learn some, some basics about management. Because everybody, say for example, who loses their job in this COVID environment, may say, boy, what can I do next? You know what? I can cook. Maybe I'm going to catering. But you may not have had any basic skills or training in management. You may not understand some of the intricacies of managing your own business. And so we try to help you with that. But part of the reality is that three months after you have done this short course with us, you are caught up in the hustle, the hustle and bustle against stock, the hustle and bustle of doing your invoicing, the hustle and bustle of chasing behind the necessary things that are inputs to your business. And frankly speaking, you may be starting to take some shortcuts in the way in which you manage. There may be some issues that you had never thought of confronting before, which is how you deal with your human resources because you may have had to employ one or two people to help you. There may be other, any number of things. It might be of a legal nature, you know, um, helping you with contracts, et cetera, et cetera. And so where we think it is vitally important is that we have a dedicated set of people who can work with businesses. And I appreciate that given 10, 20,000 businesses out there, it is not going to be easy to do that um, with everybody at one time. So we need then to, to, to say target 50 or 100. Let's pick a manageable amount. Let us work with them over a period of time. 
let us deal with them in, in terms of consultancy for whatever the issues are that arise. It might be accounting as assistance, it might be, as I said, legal assistance, it may well be managerial, uh, human resource, whatever. But we have a cadre of people who we can call on, and I think that they could quite frankly be from the private sector and give people an opportunity to give back and participate in the development of this country. Um, so that we can work with some of these small businesses in a developmental way. It is not only about throwing more and more money behind the business. I, I, I feel very strongly about that. You could have millions and millions of dollars invested um, by government um, you know, as being available to business assistance. If people don't have someone to ha hold their hand mm -hmm. and help them navigate the pitfalls and understand some of the challenges involved in managing the business and involved in planning the business's continuity, then you're going nowhere. So, so we, we have to look at that. And business um, development is going to have to be in the future also about the advice support that we make available to them. So that's the trust loan mm -hmm. fund. Okay. Let's look now at fund access and the level of support that agency provides. Yeah. That's been no, around for a while. It has been around for a while. And, and again, um, the, the, the differences are important. Um, the fund access, mid, the agency for microenterprise devel um, development is going to have to be, I think, I don't want to say restructured, but one of the concerns I have when I look at the entire sector, micro, small, medium enterprises, one size, as I said earlier, never fits all. Mm -hmm. Right now, we are governed by a piece of legislation which I'm satisfied has to be changed. And in fact, we have begun the process of drafting the change legislation. Um, we've taken it to cabinet. Um, cabinet has approved, in principle, a number of the things that we are proposing to do. One of those things really has to be the range of the business interests um, financially that the trust, lo the fund, fund access, access looks mm -hmm. at. Um, right now, fund access would be beginning from around twenty thousand dollars and up to one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. We want to make it. Um, a little bit more responsive to those businesses which have plateaued out of the the micro sector where loans are are limited at five and ten thousand dollars and carry and carry those businesses into the the fund access level fund access also has to be able to be at the cutting edge of the transformation of the economy in terms of its competitiveness and in terms of enabling some of the players in this economy to remain competitive. One of the areas that I have in my mind, for example, is the um, private transportation sector. Mm -hmm. Now that private transportation sector, let me be very frank with you, is one of the few sectors in Barbados where small black businessmen have been able to survive and, and thrive. Um, <clears throat> we can't allow some of the changes about which they have no control to humbug them and eventually force them out of operation. Now, one of the things that are coming down the, the pipe, and we won't talk about energy today, because I know we're going to come back and do that another time, is the fact that we are moving to a, an economy which will no longer be driven by fossil fuel, but will be um, fossil fuel free and carbon neutral. That simply means that we will not be importing any more diesel and that kind of thing. But all of the PSVs on the road, all of the ZRs, etc., are operating mm -hmm. off of diesel. And right now, it is a very hard thing to find a vehicle of that caliber, that type, that can sit how much ever passengers, um, which is operating as a hybrid or an electric vehicle. So what is the future for these people? There has to be a way of helping them to change out into the new technology or into a cleaner form of fuel. Where does the financing for that come? Because the logical question that is going to be asked is that set is already under pressure. We've Correct. all heard their complaints during COVID. Um, you know, everybody got assistance except them, et cetera, et cetera. And I hear that and I understand it. So I have actually commissioned a, a, a request for them to sit with me. And some of the things we have to talk about really is how we help them. Now, fund access is at the, as I said, the cutting edge of that type of transformation. Um, government has been able to secure some money via the Public Sector Smart Energy Program. Um, and stage two of that program will see us, which is where we're at now, stage two of it. And that will see us um, working with um, PSVs 
as the entirety of the sector, um, to transition them by way of loans and where necessary grants, grant funding towards having the newer type of technology so that they are able then to maintain vehicles that can be um, used in the business that they, they have. Now, again, we're pitchforking down the road, but I believe firmly that we have to plan the future very carefully. We are in 2021. We come to 2039 short years away from now. For some, it seems like a long time, but the reality it is not. Because when you are looking at your, your, your budget, if you have a business right now and you're saying, well, look, 2020 was virtually a write-off. 2021 looks like if it is going to be a write-off, if it isn't already. Um, what does the future hold for 2022? There's tremendous uncertainty. We have to be able to say to these folks, look, we understand where we are. If it is that we are not going to have the availability of, of uh, an electric vehicle, then we're going to have to have clean fuel, which is compatible with, with the type of vehicle that you have. And we've got to be able to do the test to guarantee that that compatibility exists so that there'll be confidence. And equally, if it is that people are going to, and some will have the opportunity to get a newer type of, of, of um, technology, which probably would be hybrid or electric, then the reality is that if you're going to buy into that technology, it comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. They are more expensive now than we anticipate that they will be in the future, simply because of the fact it is new technology the world over. And Barbados is a price taker. We don't set the price. We're just simply too small. So the conversation that we're having really is about how then we can facilitate folks like these in that sector with the necessary loans and so on at low interest rates so it is a competitive type of thing to enable them to, re um, to recreate a fleet because the entire fleet that we have on the streets of Barbados right now are the old technology. And if we do not correct that or make at least the co technology compatible with biodiesel fuel, then we're going to have a problem for that entire sector. And that is really a, a transportation nightmare. So we can't afford that. We have to fix it, and we've got to fix it as early as possible. But above and beyond that, the similar, similar to the, with the trust loan situation, Fund Access has also been um, outstanding as a development partner. Um, and part of what we are looking at is, again, the question, the basic question every time, do you have moratorium on the on the, um, the the interest? Are you going to waive the interest? Are you extending the tenor of the loan? Those are the same principles that apply in the consideration of how um, fund access will operate and has been operating. Uh, I think the both boards understand that the, cri the criteria that we're looking at right now is to try to help those people who are sincerely working um, towards keeping their business afloat and to be a partner with them in these most difficult times. And I, I don't sense that there's any, any challenge or pushback from either of the boards. In fact, quite frankly, I would be, um, I would find it difficult to tolerate any pushback on that. So, so we're, on, we're, on, we're on good ground there. Now, this new legislation that will guide the SME sector, how soon are you looking to bring it to, to Parliament? Um, the policy framework I want to have debated in Parliament when Parliament reopens. So that will be in three weeks' time. Mm -hmm. Frankly, if we begin on the order paper, I have already managed to place the um, liquor licenses legislation, which is going to be another business facilitation type of thing. And that really is simply about trying to transform the experience of getting a liquor license in Barbados. As you know, a large amount of our businesses, whether they be, let's start at the highest level, the hotels, and then you come down to restaurants, and then you have a range of business people who are operating cook shops, operating mm -hmm. canteens, whatever, and a whole range of people who are in private enterprise who do a little something on the side, and it might be something as easy as a, a kadumant type arrangement, or it might be something that they do every single weekend, for example, in Oystins. All of these people who are selling alcohol need to have liquor licenses. But the experience for a liquor license has been nightmarish. Sometimes you go and stand up outside the magistrate's court from 9 a.m. until 2 in the afternoon, and you still haven't gotten your mm -hmm. liquor license. Um, so we are trying to make sure that there's a brand new piece of legislation that allows for that to become an almost instantaneous thing. We are going to rely heavily on online applications and online deliveries of it. So we bring it kicking and screaming into the 21st century. But it is really about business facilitation for the average Barbadian who is interested in some entrepreneurship. And as we know, a lot of our entrepreneurial activity turns on the, 
the, um, the, the sector which is related to entertainment and so on. Um, another key thing that we will do is to make sure that this, um, these licenses can be seasonal. So that, again, I look at crop over and the facilitation of crop over. One of the things that became very clear to me when I was in tourism, and I must say the Prime Minister is very supportive of this, is that, you know, we make people who are working to support the industry of tourism too hard. Um, we, we, we work them tremendously by making them have to run about from pillar to post. There needs to be some way of making sure that if I have a license for an activity, whether it be a banfet or whatever, um, and I have it for Saturday night, that I don't have to go back for one, two, two weekends from now, and another one three weekends from now. So you come with seasonal licenses, which allow me at the start of the season to operate on this license right through to the end of the season taking out the unnecessary bureaucracy, facilitating the business, uh, making life easier for those people who wish to do some entrepreneurship. Earlier you spoke about extending the level of support given to businesses to help them stay in business. Yeah. One of the <coughs> initiatives is the Financial Literacy Bureau. Right. Tell us about where you are with that. Okay, well, this is really a, a, a pet project for me. Um, it is really recognizing that we are talking about a, a financial ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We have to realize that when we, and I, I begin with an analysis of the small and micro business sector in Barbados. Frankly speaking, and I must be candid with you, Lisa. Please. Too many of the black businesses in Barbados is disappear almost as soon as the operator, the founder of the business either goes, goes into retirement or alternatively he says, well, you know, um, there are some challenges and I ain't able to keep this afloat any longer. We have to look realistically and, and do the comparisons. On one island, it should not be that you can have businesses evolving out of a certain race and class of the country, collapsing in short order, comparatively short order, but on the same island, businesses belonging to a different race of the country, surviving for hundreds of years. And I say that in all sincerity. To fix it then becomes the challenge. One of the things that we have to look at is um, uh, the question of business continuity. Mm -hmm. um, we have to help people to understand also that, and I hinted on this before, when you go into business, it's not just about starting up something brand new, but understanding where you're going. There are some terms that change from time to time because of the stylistics of the age we live in. I am told that nowadays the idea of a business plan is being replaced in theory by the idea of a business model canvas. But the same thing really is in both cases. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? You have to have a plan as where you're taking this business from the time you start it, two years from now where you want it to be, three, four, five years from now where you want it to be, and how you get it there. That's your business plan. You have to have a marketing plan because everybody who has a business has to be able to sell something. But how are you going to sell it? Wh who is your target market? How do you reach that target market? How do you maintain the target market? How do you work, work through how your competitors are doing and as compared to you and what you need to do to change or improve, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Similarly, every business has challenges because of the fact that they must manage their finances. Some people are able to better do that than others, largely because they are trained or have access to people who are trained in doing this. And I come from a profession, frankly, where that is obviously a challenge. Uh, too many of my colleagues have had difficulties in managing financing, and that is why we have what we have had at the bar. Um, but it is not true of lawyers only. It is true of accountants. It is true of, surprisingly, it is true of accountants. It is true also of, of doctors, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, the ongoing training of people in business, therefore, is something that we have to confront and to face and, and fix. I think that in Barbados, we have tended to believe that it wasn't necessary or that it was too small an amount of people for it to matter. I don't share that view. And quite frankly, the more I've discussed it with people in this country, I think that there's a wide buy-in in terms of understanding the importance of financial literacy. Um, the word literacy, sometimes people seem as treat as though it is being a little bit offensive because if I need literacy, you're saying to me that I am literate. Right. Mm -hmm. But let's get past that. Effectively, it is about understanding the importance of some of these things. Even beyond that, it is also the importance of how you continue the financing opportunities and access to financing that the business has. Um, for example, 
venture capital, angel financing, all of these are terms out there, but what do they mean to the average man? Sometimes, and I found this again when I was tourism minister and we were talking to the unions about serious investment and so on, and we say to the union, we want to bring your union membership along with us. Uh, this was a conversation we had at the cave and equally at the airport. The reality is that the union membership themselves don't necessarily fully appreciate the benefit of owning shares or the challenges associated with owning shares. Um, so it is, a, 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 again, an educational process that has to, to take place. Um, the bottom line is that there's too much taken for granted in terms of macro topics which have not been broken down into simple language and simple speak for the average ordinary Barbadian man and woman to understand. And it is equally true, I must tell you, that it is important for us to have this as top of mind awareness now in the classrooms of the country. I've had the benefit of a lovely meeting with the officials of the Ministry of Education. Um, the minister herself uh, is very supportive of the idea. Um, where we're at is planning to see how we can fit this into a curriculum. And obviously that is something that we would hope to have in stream by September of next year. There are other countries in the Caribbean which are also doing this. Jamaica, for example, is having it in its curriculum because people are understanding the importance of getting our young people, even at primary level, to understand savings, to understand investment, to understand what it is to own shares, to understand what the benefits are of shares, understand the challenges associated with a stock market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and if we can get the vast majority of our businesses up to that level, then there is a greater appreciation of the, the, the ebb and flow of commerce in any given country. So yes, it is, it is something I think is an idea whose time has come. We are definitely going about it. And we're looking at three real pillars. The first is that obviously we're going to have to have some clinics. COVID has been a challenge because we began, we launched formally in, I think it was October or November of last year at Queen's College School. Um, and we started to reach out into different communities, but then the shutdown or the pause has caused us now to back off of the, the, the physical clinic. It can be moved online. All of the modules are, are being restructured as I speak to you so that they can be delivered online. And I think, frankly speaking, if we had to do it online exclusively, we could do that. Mm -hmm. Ideally, though, we would still want to give people an opportunity to have some physical um, interaction. Uh, beyond that clinic thing, there's also the um, business development aspect of the thing, where we will have, again, as I said, to work with a set of people who offer some sort of consultancy advice on some of the more technical issues. But again, every business needs that at some stage. And where we have suffered is that we've left too many people in business in Barbados out on a limb by themselves uh, when they probably could have salvaged their business by way of having access to somebody giving them consultancy advice. And equally, um, if we're going to have a program like this continue, and my feeling is, and again, I'm happy to say the Prime Minister shares this view, that this is something that should be etched forever into the landscape of the country then if we're going to do that, we're going to have to be able to ensure that we are able to assess how deeply into the society we've penetrated. So we're going to have a third phase of this where we're actually then measuring the and taking an understanding of how far this has reached, how many homes have an understanding of what we're doing, how many people have participated. When you're able to take stock of that, then you're in a position to say, well, this is what we need to do now as we go forward to refresh um, interest and, and deepen appreciation of what the financial li literacy effort is all about. There's one other concern I have about it above and beyond business continuity and that is to be frank with you Lisa it also is about financial inclusion. This, the greatest burden of um, poverty falls most heavily on the shoulders of um, the poorest people in society. That, 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 that is to state an obvious thing because you're talking about poverty. But economic challenges usually fall most heavily on the shoulders of the poor. In Barbados, the largest amount of households um, are already single parent households and they're female. And if you look at the percentage of single parent female households um, which are in poverty, you will see that that too is in the largest category. Mm -hmm. 
So we have to find a way of making sure that we do not exclude a large swath of the female population of Barbados from opportunities for self-development. And that's what I mean by the financial inclusion side of this thing. So it becomes a very important undertaking because what you're really doing is giving people, um, a, and I go back to the word literacy, you go give people an understanding and an opportunity to appreciate and understand what it is that you have to do in order to navigate the peaks and troughs of operating a business. And then once you understand that, you work with them in a developmental way to make sure that they are staying on stream um, and that they are doing the things that they need to do to keep the business um, going the way it needs to be done. And that is basically the financial inclusion that, that I'm, I'm driving at. Otherwise, we will have businesses starting and disappearing from the landscape or people not being equipped to start their business at all. Uh, but you, as we've worked out already, there's a large desire, body of desire out there to be uh, financially independent and to be in business. Now, before coming on air, we were speaking about a collateral registry. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, again, <coughs> the, <laughs> I suppose it fits neatly into what we were saying before. The, the way in which we get money in Barbados, the, the, the way in which you go to, to, to obtain a loan, really is premised on some ancient concepts. It is almost medieval in its construct. Um, by and large, not exclusively, but in the vast majority of the time, if you start a business and you want to get some money, you have to go and you've got to show the um, bank a, a piece of evidence that you have land or alternatively that you have um, a house and land. Far too often, we have businesses where people have financed the start of that business by taking out another mortgage on their house. So the business is now, or the owner of the house, the family maker, is now exposed to two risks. Mm -hmm. One, the risk involved in keeping that mortgage because that is the roof over my children's head, and the risk involved because this is also the way in which the, the, the business, the family business is going to be operated. And if something happens, for example, COVID, then you are faced with a situation where the two risks now coincide and there is deep, deep water and tremendous fear. And, and as I indicated to you er earlier, for some people, even threat, thoughts of suicide because you're about to lose everything, most precious home and the business all in one. So we have then to find a way in which we can help um, businesses in Barbados to be able to access loans that help them to operate and to develop if they do not have um, access to house and land. Um, for those people who don't have access to house and land, what then do they have? They may have, for example, uh, a mechanic, will have his tools, he will have the equipment, etc. Those people in agribusiness, they have livestock, which has value and a lot of equipment as well on a farm or whatever they're operating on, that too has its value. Um, the people who are in fishing, for example, you may, be, you may be land poor, but you may be asset rich by virtue of the fact that you have access to three, four, five fishing boats. Mm -hmm. Each of those boats have its value. Um, what we've had to understand and what other parts of the world have embraced is the reality that you, you can have many types of asset. Some of these assets are movable. Everything is not fixed property like house and land. And if it is, if it is possible, let us then help to avoid a man or a woman having to recommit their home towards um, obtaining money for the business by giving them another option. Uh, that option could be where we have the immovable assets. And the immovable assets in some parts of the world are treated as your accounts receivable. So that the hairdresser, for example, who has been doing hair, hair braiding, et cetera, et cetera, she has been doing hair braiding for 150 clients. And all of those clients don't necessarily pay her the full amount every mm -hmm. time they go. There may be a little bit of trust and thing going on there. You may decide that you're going to pay me at the end of the month for work that I did for you, whatever. But that's part of your accounts receivable you should be able to pledge against that. As long as you can establish that you, you have these accounts receivable, then that is something that you can use towards helping you get your loan. 
equally your your if you're on the farm your 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 crop your livestock etc you can pledge that towards helping you get your loan your equipment if you're in a farm or factory uh, your equipment is also something that you can use to help you get your loan essentially therefore the collateral w the collateral becomes a wider concept than just house and land the benefit is that by having a registry you can protect now the person who is lending by virtually by virtue of saying look you can't have um, one piece of collateral mm -hmm. if it isn't registered to me be, or if it is registered to me rather being used to borrow from you Lisa so if it is that the person is going to use me or my institution to borrow then you register the collateral with me that then means that I hold that or I have an interest in that collateral so that my loan is satisfied that loan then can, that person can't equally take the same collateral and use it over by you because it is already registered by me having done that we protect the people who are lending the money because they too must be protected but what we also do and most importantly is that we create a new swath of opportunity by virtue of the fact that you can now borrow against um, against movable assets where before you could not borrow against movable assets and you may be land resource poor but you may be asset rich in a number of different ways and I think it is important because as we know all through Barbados there are small businesses where you go into a village and I use in my constituency Redmond Village I can think of mechanics in Redmond Village they got they got tools and equipment um, but no land. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of hairdressers in my constituency who have equipment and so on and clients and, and therefore there's accounts receivable but they necessarily own the land where they live. Um, equally I, I know because I have a coastal community in my constituency that there are people who own fishing boats but there are tenants on the land where they live. These people can use the things that they have in their business to help them re um, recommit more resources to the business, help the business develop um, outside of just a reliance on house and land, which has been the traditional way in which business has been done in this country from as far back as the memory of mankind can run. Um, yes, there are one or two instances where there have been variations on that, but we all know it largely depends then on who you know in the banking structure, who can do you a favor, who can help you. And this has to be something where there is certainty now brought to bear that irrespective of who you know or where you come from in the Barbadian society, if it is that you have some assets and those assets can be registered somewhere so that you protect the interests of the people who are lending you the money, register them and there's a formal structure for doing that put in place and then afterwards you access the money. And that is the way in which we help people who are in the, the second hand car business, we help people who are in the motor mechanic business, we help people who are in the fishing industry, all of those uh, thousands of, of small and micro businesses in Barbados that need to have um, a few options because things are fairly difficult in the formal financial sector right now. Minister Vending, let's move on to vending, an area that Fine. you're passionate about. Fine. During the estimates debate, you announced that a bill is now ready to be brought to Parliament which will look at decriminalizing vending. Why has it taken so long? <laughs> I think that's a wonderful question. I, I wish I could ask you why. I've only been minister for um, a few months now. But let me say to you that <clears throat> I don't want to speak about the past administration. I really can't explain. I've heard the utterances from as far back as that too. I know that when we came to office, we decided that we were going to prioritize this issue. And um, my colleague, Minister Sutherland, would have been minister responsible for commerce and small business at the time. And he would have done a lot of the um, heavy lifting at the start. It was left for me to take it over the line. Um, <coughs> and that is where we're at right now. It is a priority for this government for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, let me start with the, the decriminalizing thing. When, and, and you have to understand the plight of poor people. When once you are saying, I am going to try to do my living an honest way, um, I'm going to go into town, I'm going to set up whatever it is, and I'm going to offer this on sale. Through no fault of your own, there may be some people who um, were store owners or are store owners who may feel that 
instead of having a discussion with you about where you're located, it has to be a confrontation with you about where you're located. Um, it may be that the, there is an issue in the immediate area and the police say, you can't be there, so you have to move. Um, whatever the, the in intervening factor is, far too often vendors in Barbados have been stuck in a situation where um, their produce, even if those, that produce is perishable, for example, fruits and so on, vegetables, things that will spoil and be lost, those things are taken up and in some instances the vendor never sees them again. So you've spent good money, good time, effort, energy, and the raw material, which is your, your produce, that is the core of your business, is taken away from you. You never see it, you see it again, you can't trace it, etc., etc. And worse yet, there's no compensation. Now you can't treat people so forever. And that unfortunately has been the pattern of Barbados' evolution if you go back as far as 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 the the British rule of this country and, and days of slavery. Um, there were vendors and those were the ways in which vendors were forced to operate and the conditions they were forced to endure. Um, there's another aspect to this as well. <clears throat> the conditions of work. I truly feel that we have to have dignified labor at all levels of the country. And there is an obvious indignity to asking people perpetually to be at work in a set of circumstances where there's no nearby bathroom facility. Um, I think there's obviously a public health um, issue that we have to confront as well because it is not the most desirable thing for people to be asked to sell stuff which might be food stuff, etc. in circumstances where the, the person selling can't wash his or her hands and so on and so forth. Um, and we equally have to understand we've got to treat ourselves better as Barbadians. Um, and we are as good a society as we are a people who treat uh, the least among us. And if we don't treat to the least among us well, then we really don't treat to ourselves as a society well. And that is long before we get to the benefits which probably could be derived from an enhanced tourism product. Um, you know, people coming here and seeing, for example, nicely designed laybys, etc., for for um, tour buses or whatever to pull off on the highway and experience the coconut water um, thing, whatever else you may have. So for all of those reasons, we felt it was necessary to do something about the vending situation. Um, the legislation will most certainly protect the interests of the vendors and, and, and give them rights over their property so that if you move the property, um, then it, it has to be able to be traced. I must be able to get back what is mine. It can't be allowed to perish and then you give it back to me. So don't give me back spoiled fruit. And if in fact that happens, then I have to be compensated for the value of what you, what you have um, taken from me. So there is now a responsibility for the first time ever on the part of the state to treat to the, the vending community in a manner that is dignified. And in the, quite frankly, in the manner that we would treat to any other business in Barbados, the, the police would not walk into to, to any store or any, any, any establishment and just take up a pet boat and break up or whatever and there not be an issue of compensation arising. So therefore the same thing must apply to this group of people. Um, at least that is our judgment. Um, equally, the legislation will define areas where there will be now zones for vending. And it falls to us now to correct some of the mistakes of the past. We have to identify these zones um, and we must do so where highway has already been established. Um, but we will try as far as possible to make sure that all those people, and I've walked the length and breadth of that highway, I've spoken to the, 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 the vendors, especially those doing the coconuts and so on. I have told them that this is really now about me helping them, but they have to help us as well because there's a equally responsibilities. You're not just getting rights. You're also going to have some responsibilities. You've got to keep the place clean and sanitary. Um, and they quite frankly gave me assurances. One or two have subsequently broken the assurances because they said let it begin from now even before we get the legislation. But, you know, we are fighting a public health crisis with COVID. We need not fight one involving dengue and other things that are mosquito-borne illnesses. And so therefore, leaving coconut shells, for example, alongside the highway overnight is not on and it has to stop. I've made that very clear. But part of the way forward really has to be, as I said, designing zones, 
along certain parts of that highway where people, and in other areas as well, where people will be able to come and, and um, pull over, where vendors will be set up, where they will have a space designated for them, where you're responsible for that space, um, where there will be facilities which are commodious so that there will be running water, there will be bathrooms. Uh, ideally, I would like to have some lighting as well, mm -hmm. let me say that, because I think that we also have to be prepared to take this into uh, a nighttime experience. And I need not tell you, when I was in tourism, we did the nighttime experience um, down by Pelican. Um, I think it is very important for us not to see vending as a eight to four job. Um, uh, we have had discussions about Bridgetown in a very serious way. The, I am pleased actually to say to you that the um, credit union movement has committed to supporting us with regard to the um, assistance we need in obtaining stalls and kiosks in Bridgetown because one of the things that we recognize is that the impact uh, on the, the vendors not only visually, but enhancing their, their, that which they do um, is important. And if we can have kiosks and stalls that are pretty much looking similar, Uniformed. design similar, a uniformity, it goes a long way, especially in that Swan Street experience. And so the credit union movement is ha happily, I, I have to say, has said that they will partner with us. Um, the Samuel Jackman Prescott um, Institute, equally the Barbados Community College, that is re where we will source the technical design and um, there's a competition we will have for the students in order to, to do the design and the building of the kiosk so that we are really looking at refurbishing the entire vending experience. Um, and as I said to you, I, I am mindful of the need for us to start to look seriously at what can be done at night. And I think it would be ideal if we can get, for example, the National Oil Company or any others to partner as well so that we can put a little solar panel on the roof of a, a stall, allowing a vendor to have access to electricity and therefore business to continue at night time. Uh, there are parts of the world, I, I experienced it in Ghana, um, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, the vendors are still working. Um, and I think that it allows for Barbadians then to start to be more connected to this vital sector. We came along looking down our noses at these people, and these people are a critical part of the economic base of the country, and quite frankly, the heart of its survival. After COVID hit, we saw the, the outpouring all around the island of, of vending stalls and so on. People are doing a legitimate business, and they're trying to do it in a legitimate way to keep their families alive, and they need to have the support. So, so that is where that legislation is, is aimed at going. My final question to you. Given the fluid situation with COVID, mm -hmm. what would you love to see for the SME sector within the next year? I really would love to see a, a consensus on recovery. I think that there's a lot of opportunity that has presented itself. And frankly, I think that we in Barbados have a tendency of, of looking too much at the negatives and not at the opportunities that come out of the negative. Um, a year ago, we were not teaching anybody in this country seriously online. Now, that is a norm. A year ago, I would have had a fight to get fast food restaurants to put food in a vehicle and deliver it to somebody's house. Now, that is a norm. Uh, you know, a year ago, we were not selling clothing and so on in any serious way online. Now, that is a norm. And, and, and effectively, what we've been able to demonstrate is that out of the, the challenge, people have seen opportunity. It is the worst possible thing in the world for people now to say, if we get over this hump, to go back to how we were. We need now to be using the technology in order to go forward. And we need to be using the, the, the experience of the challenge in order to put us in a position where, you know, we, we are doing new things and trying new things. And I think that that is where we have to build the consensus. Yes, it is difficult. I understand that. Yes, we are strapped for cash. I appreciate that. As long as I am minister in this sector, I will fight the hardest I can in order to, to find money for the sector, but it is more than money. Uh, the financial literacy thing transcends money, it is about educating. The collateral registry thing transcends money, it is about facilitating business. 
um, you know, there are several ways in which we can do new things in order to try to deliver to the sector and for the sector. Um, I don't think that people focus enough on the opportunity sometimes. I think we focus a little bit too much on the, on the challenges and it allows it to weigh us down. But we can get over that. Minister, thank you so thank much. You. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> it's been my pleasure too, Lisa. That was the Minister of Energy, Small Business and Entrepreneurship, the Honourable Kerry Simmons, speaking about entrepreneurship and small business. And I am Lisa Lord for One on One.